Um, I'm very excited to introduce uh, Guillaume Bassoon from uh, Leonard, which is a, a part of Vinci. Um, if I understand, he'll probably explain it better for me. Um, and uh, Guillaume and I uh, first met back at Stanford when we were both doing our masters there. And he worked for several years for an innovative industrialized construction company called Bone Structure before moving back to France. And I think he's very uniquely qualified to speak about both industrialized construction and the perspective of kind of investment in venture capital innovations and accelerators. So uh, with that, Guillaume, we, we welcome you. Thank you for coming and uh, look forward to, to your talk. Thanks for your uh, generous introduction, Danny. Um... I, so uh, first of all, I'm sorry about the setup. I, I got like my voice on one side and the video on the other side. So I hope you can, you can follow what's going on. Uh, probably at this stage of uh, the pandemic, you're quite good at dealing with this kind of stuff. Um, so I guess, yeah, like a, a few words of, uh, a few words of background about me before I, before I jump in. Um, I spent quite a bit of time uh, trying to build products that would be it's essentially changing the status quo in the way industrialized construction becomes adopted by smaller and larger players in the United States. And that led me to, uh, to join the Vinci group uh, within Leonard, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, hopefully some of you uh, will have a chance to, uh, to uh, come say hi at some point in Paris. Um, and for, for which I now run uh, what we've been calling internal and external ventures. And so I'll um, get into a little bit of that and what it means. Um, really feel free, um, feel free to, um, you know, write questions down as you, um, as you have them. Um, I'm excited to have a, a conversation with you. I know it's, uh, it's hard via Zoom, uh, but uh, really it's fair game. If you have any questions or if you want to continue the conversation later uh, via uh, email or, or LinkedIn or you know what, what have you I'd be very happy to very happy to do that um, so let me share my screen and get started um, and uh, okay I'm gonna go full screen that should be good so uh, it's a bit of a catchy uh, first slide uh, coin construction technology a trillion uh, euro opportunity but actually, when I when I put this slide together, I, I realized it was not an exaggeration because we're generally speaking about something that's close to eight trillion uh, euros that are spent every year on building things worldwide. Uh, I told you about my background. Uh, it actually I was really not planning to go into construction in any way. Um, I ended up. Uh, joining a project called the Solar Decathlon back at Stanford. I didn't do much, but uh, they let me uh, put a few nails in and make sure that uh, the envelope was tight. And uh, it's something that I just jumped in afterwards uh, through, uh, through several, uh, several different experiences. Uh, but just to give you an idea of, I guess it's interesting for students. Uh, I started as a nuclear engineer. I worked as a physicist and I ended up you know, doing a product-based industrialized construction startup. And now I work for a large corporation and my job consists of making these PowerPoints 95% of the time. Um, so really what I've been trying to capture is that I think there's a revolution in the making. And I'm actually like looking back at, uh, at Danny to see if, you, if you've actually seen this slide before. So, uh, this is something that was done by Box, um, which is essentially the same as Dropbox. And what it shows are essentially links and nodes, um, nodes being uh, either individuals or companies. And the, the blue ones are external to the main organization. The red ones are internal to the main organization. And so there's a few things you can see here. Uh, that you know, I think are really telling. If you look at financial services, banking, the banking industry, you see this process wherein uh, every major decision comes from the top down and everything is reported all the way back up and it's completely connected and there is no external agent. Uh, looking at the extreme opposite of construction, 
you see that almost every agent, almost every stakeholder is a blue dot, meaning they're not part of the main company. They communicate, they communicate very little with one another. They have no lateral exchanges. And often you have a cascading line between several blue dots before you get to a red dot. And that's what in some ways you can call the, uh, the, the, the fact that there is no integration in this industry, which makes it particularly interesting when you think about making it change because no single player can make the whole system change. Uh, I'm sure you've seen this, however, uh, talking about productivity in uh, construction and how it's stagnated over the last 15 to 20 years. Um, it's not necessarily a problem. And that's like so something that is interesting when you talk to people. The problem is that uh, building things have become, has become so expensive that we can't house people, that we can't afford to build infrastructure and so on. So it's not just, oh, we need to be more productive for the sake of it. It's preventing us from meeting basic needs that society has. Uh, another slide that uh, actually, I'll, I guess I'll send that uh, McKinsey uh, report. This is from a later one uh, that's looking at construction technology and sort of like divvying up what is what and where it comes from. And uh, uh, really what you're looking at on the, on the left is the number of types of companies that are in any given family and how they're related. Um, it's not that easy to understand in a quick second, but what I, what I want you to focus is on, is on the right. And you see all the different new things that people are starting to do within our world of uh, construction. Uh, whether it is very software centric, like uh, number seven on the left uh, side, portfolio planning and management, uh, whether it is more on the, uh, on the design side with uh, things that are linked to uh, design management, design simulations, especially around energy, for instance, or things that are very, I would say, down to earth, like uh, robotics, drones, uh, automation of tasks, um, and so on. So uh, I don't know how far you are in your, in your process of, uh, of uh, entrepreneurship, but looking at those different categories and thinking how uh, they could apply to what you're doing, and then maybe also looking for comparable companies could be interesting. Uh, now, this is something that I, I, I stole from a, a, a venture capital firm called Building Ventures. Very interesting people. Um, they, actually, they did give me permission for this. <laughs> I'm recorded now, so I better say it. Um, it's uh, putting side by side something that we've seen and know well, which is the way um, the manufacturing industry for uh, tech and specifically for uh, laptops and computers has evolved between a 1970s version of it and a 2000s version of it. Um, it used to be that in the 70s, what was widely perceived as the place where you have most value added was the fabrication, the fabrication of the different computers, different laptops. It was thought that it's the one that is able to make the best agency of these things that will have the best product and therefore win the market. And what's happened and what, what was foreseen by uh, this gentleman on the right from Acer uh, is that it was likely that the fabrication part would become commoditized. And if you know just a little bit about how an iPhone is done, how it's made today, or how Intel works, or how this all hardware side of the industry works, this, is, this was a true prediction. Now you have major companies that do these elements for every single computer maker. And so uh, this uh, Stan Schiemann uh, figured out that the opportunities would be on R&D and distribution, distribution meaning getting closer to the final user and not just being in a big box store. If you think about this for a second, it looks a lot like what a company like Apple is like today. Very heavy investment in R&D, very heavy investment in distribution, fabrication, entirely outsourced. So long 
and winded introduction in a way to get you to, okay, well, could, could we be looking at something similar with construction? And could industrialized construction be this sort of commoditization that the equivalent of that commoditization that we saw for the computer industry? Which would mean that some actors that focus on just construction and just focus on putting all the parts together could be in trouble and that maybe they should need, they should focus on, in this example, design and pre-construction and operations. So this is not something that we can know for fact, but it's a good question to ask and sort of a nice framework to think through these, uh, these problems. Uh, getting back to this actually same uh, McKinsey report, they're very harsh with general contractors. Uh, first of all, highlighting uh, the structurally very low margins of operation. And I can tell you that two to 4% is quite generous because what I've seen is more between minus two and plus three. Uh, and the harsh part is what I, what I highlighted. Model could become obsolete if modules and better BIM models improve planning and lower risk. Um, more specialization is what they're recommending, you know, being a more specialized contractor. It's easy to see how it would be harder to replace a company like the one we have at Vinci uh, that built the Chernobyl dome, the containment dome. It's easy to see how that would be harder to replace than a company that just builds a thousand homes all the same every year as a general contractor. Um, now this is something we, we, we talked a little bit in the, in the breakout room, but it's, now that you said this, what does it mean in terms of disrupting a business and how fast can it move and how fast should it move? And I guess I would argue that in our case, we don't really have clear examples of disruption just yet uh, in our industry. Um, some of us that look at this every day could argue that there are some clear signs. Uh, I'm sure that some of you have seen examples or could make that argument, but it's not at the stage where you have most CEOs of most major uh, construction companies that are saying, wow, I need to change everything or go bankrupt. Uh, I haven't seen that. So we're still in the early stages, but I'm seeing that it's moving quite fast and that you know, people with your training uh, will become very strong assets for, for either startups trying to be part of this disruption or people like me, like I am right now within a, a larger corporation uh, trying to see how we go about self-disrupting or partnering with companies or building our own innovation. And so I want to give you two or three examples of companies that I've seen on the outside that I think carry a seed of disruption. One of them is Canvas. We were just talking about it. Uh, these guys have, on the technological part, it's a robot that uh, helps finish drywalls and they do a better job faster and cheaper than any human could ever do. Uh, so that's cool. That, that's good. That it's the technology side. What's really interesting about this company is that they decided to not just be robots manufacturers and you know, try to convince people to use their robots and make money this way. What they've decided to do is they said, screw it. Uh, if people aren't using this fast enough, we are going to become a subcontractor and we're going to be the ones doing this work. So they've... Uh, in the words of, of, uh, of Danny from just earlier, they integrated the um, material side of the construction uh, industry with the material provider, with the sub-trade part of it, which isn't something that is very common. Um, another one that I've seen that I kind of use more as an example of true disruption, and there's several companies looking at this, is Nplan. And um, they're based in the UK. They just raised a whole bunch of money and they've built this machine learning uh, 
based tool that looks at complex plannings and complex financial projections. So the 4D, 5D uh, elements of a project at the design stage. And they're able to identify better than any human where there might be issues, where things might be overlapping, where there might be uh, critical paths that are not optimized and where you could have a risk of slipping on your, uh, having your budget or your schedule slip. Um, if this is true, they can save millions, sometimes tens of millions of, per, of euros per big project. And so the disruption part of this is, you know, we have people, one of the big things, for instance, a company like Vinci does better than most is we have experience with these projects, these complicated projects. And so when we say it's going to cost this much and it's going to take this long, people tend to believe us. Now, if somebody comes and they're just like these two young guys and they say, well, I can do better than all these old farts uh, that have been doing this for 30 years and they're right, it's a little, it's a little scary. And I mean, it's pretty cool for them and pretty interesting, but it's a little scary from within. Um, another one that's more about productivity that's really cool, I think, is there's technology that's coming online that didn't exist not so long ago. And in this case, it's um, having LiDAR and uh, having uh, drones that become very cheap. Um, and uh, what, they, what these guys are able to do, VHive, is they can do inspections of cranes entirely automatically you just put the drone down on the ground it looks at it, it starts going up and the flight path is completely automatic it goes back down and prevents people from having to go all the way up on the crane climbing it up and climbing it back down so really big difference in terms of productivity and safety um how much time do i have uh danny yeah, we, you, I would say about 15 more minutes and then and okay, we can that's open great. for Q&A, but we have longer if, if you need it. So you're okay for time. No, that's good, that's good. Um, so now what I want to you know, talk to you about is the Leonard uh, strategy. Uh, so Leonard, again, being the innovation arm of the Vinci Group. Um, and it's not so much uh, you know, to tell you, oh, you know, we're doing all these great things. Um, it's really about, uh, from my perspective, I've been building a few of these uh, tools and it's trying to think how they can be helpful for the, the issues and the, 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 the dynamics that I was just presenting. Um, and so we share this widely, uh, widely with uh, other uh, corporations, other groups. And uh, I hope to see a lot more of that in the future in our industry. But so what we've done is we've, we've put together a group of 20 odd, 20 or so people from different backgrounds uh, looking, at a, a, um, looking at three main pillars, one of them being uh, foresight, so a bit of a think tank style approach where we think, okay, what is construction going to look like in 20 years and try to build back from that what a path there could look like. And we also have folks that uh, do really good work in terms of, uh, I think, in terms of editorial work. So I actually uh, in invite you to check out the, the website and read some of the newsletters. Uh, it might give you some inspiration if uh, you have to write uh, papers on some of those subjects. We've really been covering a lot of the stuff that you guys are studying. Um, so ch check it out. And then the last part is what we've been calling entrepreneurial innovation for lack of better, better term. And that's really what I want to talk to you about. And uh, the reasons we've been doing this and essentially what I've been uh, presenting to, uh, to um, the leadership of our company is I said, look, you know, this, these are the reasons why we should be focusing on this. And one is uh, safety um, generally speaking, uh, you're, you're not without knowing that construction still is uh, one of the industries that is the most dangerous for the people that go into it and are on the field. Uh, and you'd be surprised the care and time and focus that 
is uh, associated with trying to reduce risk on construction sites today. Like I hear it all the time, even from the CEO of Vinci. It's really central to their uh, operations. Uh, I guess I was a little more cynical uh, being younger, and I thought, you know, they probably don't care, but they really do care. Uh, and, you know, so that's very central and very easy to get people on board when you talk about this. Uh, the other one is the environment. A big difference between the US and uh, Europe uh, is the US has lofty goals in terms of environment, but they're not hard uh, coded into the law. They're not, uh, it, it, it's okay, we should be doing this and here's an objective for 2050, but in Europe and now, in, especially in France, the rules have become so that uh, you need to have a very clear path uh, to uh, have a much lower environmental impact. And so Vinci had a commitment made uh, for 2030 uh, that are pretty drastic and that frankly, no one really knows how we're gonna get there. So innovation is needed and so, that's a big part of it. And then productivity and competitivity. Productivity is really how do we optimize the bottom line of projects? How do we make them faster, better, more efficient? Competitivity is more, you want to win a bid. You better have some, you know, cool edgy stuff as well now because that's what people are expecting. So that's, competitivity is the one that I would say is easily uh, associated with innovation washing. Sometimes it's not that important, uh, but it could make you win bids as a company. So I'm trying to move on to the next one. What do I do? Here we go. Um, okay. So this is what I was telling you about worker safety, just a few examples, like noise is a big problem because people can't hear danger coming their way. Uh, we have people working in environments such as tunnels or, or nuclear, state, nuclear uh, power plants where uh, they can't like connect with people via cell or like normal transmission. So those are dangerous environments. Uh, when it comes to uh, nature and our environment, uh, we have a, a an actual footprint issue during construction that is has a big a big part of it is concrete, but it's not anywhere close to that. Uh, productivity examples like the Vhive uh, company that I showed you, examples like drones looking at site progress automatically and feeding into a schedule uh, as opposed to people doing this manually. Um, also checking potential mistakes being done, uh, avoiding rework. It's a very big deal. Like I told you, uh, competitivity, I'm not quite as excited to talk about it. And so what, what, what did we do on our side to sort of try and meet these challenges? There's two things that uh, I think could be of interest to you. Uh, one of them is an intrapreneur track. And uh, what this is, is uh, it's a program where we pick people from within the company that have cool ideas, just like uh, you are coming up with ideas and pitching them and looking at the way they're, they can be structured and where they could go and how much money you would need to do it. We do the same thing for internal projects pitched by internal uh, resources of Vinci. Um, so far, sorry for the formatting, but uh, so far we've done this for 68 people over five cohorts. And um, there are today 10 business units within Vinci that have been created through this process. Um, so it's not huge for a, a company that has 250,000 people. Um, actually, it's very little. Um, but what we're trying to do is identify internal startups that have a true almost billion euro company potential and focus on that so that it's not very many people, but that there's chances that uh, they can actually build something unique and, and potentially revolutionary. Um, I will send you the, the, um, 
the presentation so you can look into this deeper and also maybe find examples that inspire you. Um, but one example I can give you, which now isn't even that cool anymore is a digital waste marketplace uh, that connects a recycling center and waste disposal centers with, um, with the job site, with the construction site. Um, it's a place where there still is a huge lack of efficiency. And so we created this business unit that is now one of the leading uh, companies doing this in France. Um, so that's just one example. Another program, uh, actually two other programs in this case that those are my babies because that was my first, my first, first bit of my job at, at uh, Leonard was building these programs is our startup side of the operation. And so, sorry about this slide again, <laughs> with the formatting issues and um, I know it's a little busy, but if you think about the life, the life cycle of a startup, uh, you'll be looking at things being incubated or created in, in universities or incubators before they reach investors. And so what we've been meaning to do is a place is to build a program, meaning a place, uh, an amount of financing and a program that helps young entrepreneurs get to the point where they can successfully pitch investors and actually raise money. There's not many people that do this for the construction world. I think we're one of the only ones doing this in Europe. Um, and uh, there's a few ones in the United States too, but it's not very prevalent in our industry just now. Uh, so it's been very exciting to you know, be among the first, at least in France, to, uh, to, to look at this. The second program uh, is answering the, it's called Catalyst, and really it's answering the second question. Okay, well, now I have an interesting working startup. How do I go about working with a large group that does not want to change their ways? Um, and that's why we built this Catalyst program. Uh, what we do is we, we identify about 10 companies every year that we think, are, we think are the best in the world at what they do. And we work really hard at finding people for them to work with within the corporation. Um, and really the objective is that they build meaningful, uh, mutually beneficial business relationships over the course of months and years. Um, and I just want to give you, these are even busier, so I'll let you look at it if you, if you want later, but I want to give you a couple examples of those companies I'm talking about. So this is the last cohort of our seed program. And uh, it's not, we're not all uh, construction. Uh, we're construction, concessions, mobility, uh, energy, real estate. So there, it's a big conglomerate, but we're mostly focused for this program on construction. And so you can see here, there's PaintUp, that's a robotic solution to, uh, to do facade treatments, uh, meaning uh, painting or, or sanding uh, at you know, quite high locations that are dangerous and hard to get to. So pure robotics. Uh, we've got this company, Sustain Echo, that is looking at building a tool that will enable every single job site in the world to effectively track their carbon footprint uh, the way, the same way we're doing with materials, the same way we're doing with, with balancing our accounts, uh, just to be able to do that automatically for every job site. Uh, there is no tool for this today. Um, another one that is very reminiscent of this waste marketplace business unit I was telling you about is Rockies. Uh, some of you might know Schutflix uh, in Germany. Uh, Rockies essentially is planning to do the same thing Schutflix has been doing in Germany, but for France. Uh, so it's connecting, um, connecting job sites with uh, aggregates uh, manufacturers. Um, so, just a few examples. And then for the Catalyst program, which is about building connections, um, a few companies here, 
actually told you about two of them already, so I'll just leave it at that. But end plan, we selected these guys, uh, the, the ones doing using machine learning to uh, evaluate risks in the construction process. And um, VHive, uh, which are the ones looking at uh, having drones flying around cranes. Yeah, a, a short a short question for you, if I could jump in. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> for your for your seed uh, group, um, uh, what what is the selection criteria? How do you know when you hear a compelling uh, company? What is what is it that you look for 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 these companies? So not for the catalyst, because I think that's kind of clear that we have a really nice uh, uh, idea. But for the seed ones, how how do you evaluate those? Um, it's it's uh, both art and science, uh, and there's a bit of experience that goes into it and a bit of feeling that goes into it. And honestly, that's my favorite part of the job because uh, you can actually be good at it without... You can't be good if you're just following a, a canvas. There's a little bit of uh, intuition that goes into it. Uh, the things that we're looking at, very clear though. Um, number one, Quality of the team, number one, for sure. You can have a, be a great team and have a bad idea. You can change ideas. Bad team, good idea, it's a bummer. <laughs> so uh, we're looking for great teams, number one. It can mean a diversity of things. Um, it can mean a lot of many different things. I think that's where the art part goes into it because it's, we need people that are very technical, that have a sharp understanding of how things are done, how they're not done. Uh, so I'm not huge in, oh, you know, it's like uh, people that knew nothing about the hotel industry that disrupted hotels. Honestly, hotels look kind of simple to me. Like compared to construction, I think it's quite simple. Uh, maybe it's just, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> So but that, that matches our just I mean, so last week we had a case discussion about Katera, and that was one of the things about coming from outside the industry was pitched as the as being a good thing, but maybe in the end uh, you need some industry knowledge as well. So yeah, I mean in the case without expanding too much on Katera, like in their case, the you know, looking at it from the outside as people who knew construction, they kept coming up with uh, descriptions that were like yeah, this is what we deal with all the time. And they, you know, it's like, this is what the industry is. And they were presenting it as, oh yeah, now we've seen this, like, we're going to solve that. It's like, okay, like we kind of knew this. So um, I would say not necessarily long experience in the fields, but a, a sharp understanding of how it works, even if it's on a small, very small part of the process, if that's what you're going to build a solution on, you could just know about how uh, uh, like billing is done on a job site, even if it's a small one. If you know this, you're already better than many people that try to build startups in this environment. Uh, so there's, there's that, there's uh, a pitfall that I see many people in France do, not as many people in the United States do, is, um, I'm very careful of uh, very engineering centric uh, teams uh, because it's first and foremost a business proposition. And uh, usually what I've seen is uh, United US based company have an easier time uh, looking at it this way than France based company. I've seen this for Germany as well. I'm not, I can't talk about Switzerland. Um, so that's one thing we look at ability to be client focused and trying understanding that from the get-go because that's also one direction where things could go really really wrong really fast is building a product no one wants and many people do that so that's on the team side and then it's uh, market size so one of the sayings we have is you know if you tell me there's a billion why, why do we care about billion euro markets uh, you don't need to make a billion, you know, like it's the, the reason we care about this is we know that if you're wrong, but not entirely wrong, 
you will find another opportunity that is adjacent within that billion euro market. Um, so we're looking at market size. And if it's something where you know, you're able to say, well, you know, best case scenario in six years, it will be a 10 million euro business. It's not an interesting proposition for venture capitalists. It's not a very good proposition for corporates either. Uh, it could be a passion project. It could be something that is amazing at the personal level. It could be a small enterprise that hires great people, but it's not really compatible with the model we're in. So that's the second thing we're looking at is market size. And then third and fourth is for if I'm if I'm if I'm within Vinci, I will say alignment with Vinci goals and Vinci uh, uh, sort of elements that I described: the environment, productivity, safety. And if I'm outside, I would say business model. But you see, business model comes either last or one before last, uh, and that's for very very early stage companies. So I really. It, it, I urge, I urge the, the class for first pitches and early stage pitches to focus on having a crystal clear explanation of the problem you're trying to solve, why it's a big problem, why your team is an interesting team to go about solving this problem, and then how you go about doing it with your solution. Be crystal clear about it, but we know that it's something that could change and maybe you know, probably should change 